Well, we're back to Edwards at Northampton. In 1729, he finds himself, as I mentioned, in the second largest church. Now, the first largest church was the first congregational church in Boston. Uh, this is the church where the Mathers, Cotton Mather, Increase Mather, uh, pastored. So here he is at Northampton as a 26-year-old man pastoring this church. And he's got big shoes to fill and the shoes of Solomon Stoddard. A few years into this, Edwards is invited to preach the commencement address at Harvard. Now this was a big deal. When there were commencements, all the ministers came back and uh, it was sort of like the Super Bowl of New England, commencement day. It was a big event. And these ministers would preach to each other throughout this week. And it was quite an honor. You can imagine how many ministers would be gathered there at Boston. And it was quite an honor to be picked to preach the sermon. And here's Edwards. First of all, he's a Yale grad, not a Harvard alum. So he's uh, the outsider. Second of all, Everybody is anticipating him to be Solomon Stoddard, or to be as good as Solomon Stoddard. And Edwards preaches a sermon entitled, God Glorified in Man's Dependence. And in that sermon, Edwards stresses the doctrines of grace that had come to the Puritans through Calvin, through the Reformers, that stressed that salvation is from start to finish a work of God. And that it has to be that way because salvation is to the glory of God. It's not our work. It's not for our glory. It's God's work for God's glory. God glorified in man's dependence. And so that was the sermon that Edwards preached. It was very well received, and in fact, it was published. Now, usually a sermon was published at the end of a minister's career as sort of an honorary thing to them. They would sort of preach a sermon, and somebody would step forward and pay for it to be printed, and it was published. But here's Edwards at the beginning of his ministry career getting a sermon published. And in fact, the way it was published is going to come back to haunt Edwards because it was published with another sermon by, and I'm not making this name up, William Williams. And uh, William Williams, who was one of those older ministers and out of honor and respect, one of his sermons was printed. And so the two sermons were printed together. Now, we'll see as we dip down into the late 1740s where that comes back into play. So sort of hold that uh, thought there for a while. But as we come back to Edwards, week in, week out, Edwards preached. Now, Edwards was a meticulous sermon writer. Edwards would write out his sermons. And these early sermons, he would sometimes write them out three or four or five times. Now, he would hand write these sermons. This is a... Uh, picture of about the actual size of one of Edwards' sermon manuscripts. Edwards would take a large piece of paper. Uh, it was called folio paper. I can give you a sense. It was roughly this size paper. We'll look at this one later, but that's a folio piece of paper. Edwards would take it and make a series of folds until he got it down to about a four inch square. And then he would cut the sides and then he would take a needle and he would poke a hole here and he would poke a hole here and he would get some thread and he would tie some thread through there and he made a little sermon booklet. These sermons, he could get about 15 words across and about 20 to 30 lines on a page. And a typical sermon booklet is anywhere between 40 to 60 pages. Now, that sermon wasn't always preached at one sitting. I think his congregation would go unconscious if it were. Uh, the sermon was sometimes split up. Sometimes they would preach in the morning, have some sort of lunch on the grounds, and have an afternoon session. Sometimes he would split it up over two week periods. But that was his sermon unit. Now, if you look at this, and that's actual size, 
That is very hard to read, even if you wrote it. So the idea that Edwards read his sermons probably isn't true. In fact, what most tend to think these days is that Edwards' mind was such that as he wrote out the sermon, he would memorize it, and then he would stand in the pulpit and recite it. Now, his preaching style changed after 1741. After 1741, George Whitfield had come to town, had come to Northampton, had preached in Northampton's church, even preached in Edward's house. This was very typical of Whitfield. Whitfield would preach a sermon, then he would go stay at an inn, or he would go stay in someone's house, and the crowds would find out where he was, and they would literally stand outside and wait until he would come out and preach to them again. I don't know if they would chant, we want a sermon, we want a sermon. But somehow they wouldn't go away. And so while Whitfield was staying in Edward's home, there the crowds came. And so Edwards, or Whitfield rather, preached a sermon from Edward's home. Now I can imagine the conversation. Whitfield's captivating speaker very engaging speaker, very engaging sermons. And after Whitfield leaves, Sarah lovingly over cups of coffee says to Jonathan, why don't you preach like that? <laughs> <laughs> now what Jonathan should have said was, I have to come up with a new sermon every week. Whitfield has about 10 and he can use them all the time over and over again. But Edward said, all right, and from 1742 on, Edwards stopped writing out his sermons. Instead, he would write out an outline, preach the sermon, and then on Monday, go into his study and write out the sermon he preached. So this is a remarkable mind. Don't try this at home <laughs> to imitate this mind. This is a unique person we're talking about. But Edwards wrote sermon. it's, it's sermons. It's estimated that Edwards' sermon corpus is estimated at 12 to 1400 sermons. It depends on whether some of those were intended to be divided or connected, and some there's, there's debate among that. 1200 to 1400, 15 words in a line, 30 lines on a page, 40 to 60 pages of a sermon times 1200 to 1400. That's a lot of paper. That's a lot of writing. But Edwards thought every time he stepped into the pulpit that what he was doing was in fact preaching the very word of God. So preaching was something that Edwards took as a high calling. And so he applied his energy to that. And these sermons began to affect the congregation at Northampton. There was, in 1734 to 35, a revival in the Connecticut River Valley, largely due to Edward's preaching, both at Northampton and as he would go up and down the Connecticut River Valley and preach. And Edwards wrote up a story of the revival and sent it to the papers in Boston to be printed so that it would encourage religious revival there in Boston. And the editor in Boston sent the letter across the sea to his friend, a hymn writer in England. You might have sung one or two of his hymns, Isaac Watts. And uh, he sent this to Isaac Watts. Isaac Watts read this, said, this is great. Uh, have this guy, Jonathan Edwards, write up a fuller version of this, and we will publish it as a book. So word made its way back to Edwards. In 1736, Edwards writes a faithful narrative of the surprising word of God in Hampshire County. Hampshire County is the county in which Northampton is in there in the Connecticut River Valley. The book is published in England edited by Isaac Watts, and a copy is sent back to Boston, and a copy gets to Jonathan Edwards, and he reads it, and the first thing he notices is that Isaac Watts, Dr. Watts, got the title wrong. Edwards said, a faithful narrative of the surprising work of God 
and the conversion of many hundred souls in Northampton and the neighboring towns and villages of Hampshire and New England. Watts thought that Edwards didn't know what he was talking about and he meant the colony of New Hampshire and so Watts changed it to New Hampshire. This is Edward's personal copy. Well, this isn't. This is a reproduction of Edward's personal copy, which is in the Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library at Yale University. And Edwards took out a pen and he crossed out the word new. And then you don't have it. I should have a picture of this. On the other side, Edwards writes, the first of one of many errors that the editors did to my books. And I'm so grateful for that. Anybody who's written a book, knows the fun that you can have interacting with editors. So Edwards decided I will publish the corrected copy. So he takes uh, Watts's copy, edits it all over, sends it to Boston, and a copy is printed. But that's Edwards' first book, a faithful narrative of the surprising work of God. And that book was widely read, widely circulated, and many believe was the seed, one of the seeds that would very quickly emerge as the Great Awakening in 1740 to 1742. So Edwards is preaching, he's continuing to preach, and we come into these years of the Great Awakening, 1740 to 42. It is a transatlantic phenomenon. We have Edwards in New England and other ministers where there's revival taking place, the tenants in New Jersey. And of course, we have the brothers Wesley and George Whitfield back in Old England. And both Wesley and Whitfield, I think Whitfield preached it first, but Wesley also preached a sermon by the same title, The Almost Christian. And the almost Christian is someone who thinks they're a Christian because they were in the Church of England, but they were not a true Christian just by being in the Church of England. They were an almost Christian. Well, as you can imagine, very quickly, both Wesley and Whitfield found themselves uninvited to preach in churches. No problem, they simply go outdoors. Whitfield was the first, Wesley followed, then Charles, and they simply would go outdoors and preach. They made significant impacts in the Newcastle area. Uh, this was the area, you know, picture London, right? This is the London of Dickens that's just bellowing smoke from all the coal fire, right? That's got to come from somewhere, and it comes from the coal mines of Newcastle. And so Newcastle has tens of thousands of what we would call the working poor. And nobody was paying attention to them. And here comes Wesley, and here comes Whitfield, and they begin preaching the good news of the gospel. And people start coming to Christ. Whitfield gets invited to America, goes down in the southern colonies, establishes an orphanage in Georgia, begins to make his way. Actually, he lands in Delaware his first time realizes, well, this is a pretty small state. Maybe I should look for another state. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Travels up and down the colonies. And everywhere he goes, literally thousands come to hear him preach. A Benjamin Franklin struck up a friendship with George Whitfield, published his sermons, loved to hear Whitfield preach, never believed in Whitfield's God, never accepted Whitfield's gospel, but he loved to hear Whitfield preach. It was Franklin who would estimate the crowds that would come to hear George Whitfield. Crowds upwards of 50,000 in the city of Philadelphia. Uh, Whitfield preached at a place in Lancaster where 10,000 came to hear him preach. And the population of Lancaster County wasn't even 7,000 in that time. So people would come from all over. It was actually understood that Whitfield could preach and he could be heard across the Delaware River in Camden, New Jersey, as he would preach in Philadelphia. And Whitfield was a moving preacher. Well, remember, he's only got seven sermons, so they can be really good. No, I'm kidding. He's good. <clears throat> he would take up offerings for his orphanages while he would preach. 
Franklin knew this, and so he, he went uh, one time with a couple shillings in his pocket to give to the uh, offering. And as Whitfield was preaching, he just felt, oh, I, I can't just give a couple shillings. And he, he felt so embarrassed, so he put the shillings away, so moved by what Whitfield was saying and, and being compelled. And so he, he pulls out a, a pound note. And a few minutes later, he pulls out a, a 10 pound sterling note. And then Franklin says, I'm so glad Whitfield finally stopped preaching because I was about ready to assign to him my whole estate. So this was a very moving, very moving preacher. Uh, Whitfield and others in the Great Awakening were not always so well received, however. There were the detractors of the Great Awakening in 1740 to 42. One of them was Charles Chauncey. Now, if you, and I don't mean any offense to those from Boston, so let's just get that right out on the table, but if you have the wrong caricature of the cold, stern Bostonian, and I did say wrong character, but if you have that wrong caricature of the cold, stern, stone-faced Bostonian, it's Charles Chauncey, right? Pictures of this guy, I I'm glad I was never his grandchild. I couldn't imagine going to this guy, but Chauncey uh, did not think there was any legitimacy to this work of the revivals. And just as there were detractors, there were also fanatics. And one of these fanatics was Davenport. And Davenport got so excited about the dynamic ministry of the Holy Spirit that he began to say, we don't need any books. We don't need any learning. And he actually sponsored book burning in the streets. He was jailed on numerous occasions for public disturbance. And at least at the end of his life, he published a detraction apologizing for his actions, and also acknowledging how wrong he was. But here was the revival with detractors and with fanatics. And the whole colonies were abuzz with talk of the revival. In fact, historians later will argue that the Great Awakening was a contributing factor to the American Revolution. And they look at this on a couple of levels. One, they say, a number of newspapers were established coming out of the Great Awakening. And they were established to communicate revival news so that revival in one town would spur on revival in another town and so forth. Well, those newspapers become a convenient tool for communication later as the Revolutionary War was underway. The second factor they point to is that up until the 1740s, there was no real sense of being an American. Everybody had a particular identity as the colony. They were of the colony of Massachusetts, the colony of Connecticut, the colony of New York, of Pennsylvania, the southern colonies. In fact, they even had their distinctive religious emphases. New England were the Puritans. The middle colonies were sort of a mixed bag. The southern colonies were Anglican. And then, of course, there's Maryland, the standout Catholic colony. But they had these unique identities. But the Great Awakening, see, that gave them a singular experience that unified them. And that unification would later be a crucial dynamic that would pave the way for the Revolutionary War. Edwards was right in the middle of the Great Awakening. And in fact, he preached a sermon literally in the middle of it. That is his most famous sermon. Sinners in the hands of an angry God. Now, people love, speaking of characters, they love to have characters of the Puritans. Uh, what is it? H.L. Uh, Mencken once said, a Puritan is anyone who thinks that somewhere someone might just be having a good time. Uh, I remember hearing a Volvo commercial. And the a Volvo, I'm sorry, no, it was for a Saab, a Saab commercial. And this commercial with a sort of velvety voice was extolling all the virtues of the Saab and all the luxuries of it and the leather seats and the heated leather seats and the sound system and the traction and the steering and ended the commercial, I kid you not, by saying a Puritan would not appreciate the new Saab. <laughs> so the Puritans are often caricatured as these doom and gloom sour and dour 
purveyors of fire and brimstone. Look out. God is out to get you. And if you want a sermon to substantiate that, sinners in the hands of an angry God. Oh, the imagery. Or like a spider. Here goes that beloved spider. This time he doesn't have a smile on his face. This time the spider is dangling over the pit of hell and hanging by a mere web. And at any moment, at the discretion of God, the web could break and the spider would... The bow, this is a powerful image, the bow of God's wrath is bent, right? And the arrow is ready to be flung. These are the images of sinners in the hands of an angry God. And that sermon has been anthologized in literary textbooks and history textbooks. And actually, it's probably the most widely read sermon ever preached in America. But you know, there's other imagery in that sermon too, isn't there? There's a wonderful image at the end where Edward says, Christ has flung the door of mercy wide open and stands in the way, crying unto poor sinners, come in, come home. So, yes, the sermon is about judgment. Yes, the sermon is about God's wrath. Yes, the sermon is, don't assume, don't presume. But there's also plenty of gospel mercy invitation in that sermon as well. And actually, if you look at Edward's sermon corpus as a whole, the words that occur the most, joy, pleasure, happiness. In fact, I used to think Edwards invented this word, but then I found it in earlier Puritans. Happified. Isn't that a great word? Don't you want to be happified? You know how you can be happified? By loving God and obeying God. Edwards did preach about sin, did preach about God's wrath, no doubt. He wasn't going to cave on that. He wasn't going to fade away from that. He wasn't going to whitewash the gospel. But he also expressed the joy, the sweetness, the delight, the pleasure that the gospel brings to us. Well, we'll look a little bit more at Edward's sermons, and we'll also look at what went wrong with this congregation at Northampton in our next session together.